Eraserhead. Let's do it. All right. Written and directed by David Lynch. <laughs> if only we had someone that uh, did a good David Lynch impression. Yeah. Well, we we should have had him back for the pod. Yeah, we really yeah, should have. You, yeah, I hear you guys got David Lynch. That's fucking crazy. Big yeah, get. crazy. Yeah, no, I don't know how we got him. Big get. Did he reach out to us? Uh, we play polo at the same polo club. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize he was such a good polo player. We occasionally, yeah. you know, hop on the ponies and, uh, and yeah. bat some balls around. Yeah. That's how you play polo, right? I guess so. I think so. <laughs> Did you smoke with him, Nico? <laughs> we had uh, some cigarettes. We, uh, ex- we, uh, exchanged panties, actually, and ate each other's panties. <laughs> Delicious. As you would. As you would. It's quite lovely. <laughs> uh, Eraserhead stars Jack Nance and Charlotte Stewart. Henry Spencer tries to survive his industrial environment, his angry girlfriend, and the unbearable screams of his newly born mutant child. <laughs> Adam and I saw this along with Nick Evangelista at the at the uh, Alamo Draft House yep. in Yonkers, New York. What was that? Like two years ago at this point? Yep, 2017. It was projected on 35 millimeter film. <laughs> it was awesome. And we shared a really fun podcast, the three of us, yeah, oh, in man. a darkly lit room. It felt like a David Lynch movie. It did, yeah. We that commented night. on that, too, yeah. It was uh, one of the great uh, podcast experiences I think we've ever had. Yep, one of my favorite. And, of course, Zach, of course, doesn't vote for it when we do the Wattatties, that bastard. Yes. I remember that very vividly in my head. Yes. The, the biggest grudge I've ever had with Zach Caponegro. <laughs> Fuck that kid. I'm sick of Zach. No, I'm not. Um, so we've talked about it a lot on a podcast. Jabril Mahmood has not talked about it that much on a podcast, so take it away, sir. Oh, man, I love this movie so much. It's uh, <laughs> top five all-time. Uh, top five all-time movies. Yes. For me, anyway, personally. Yeah, it's it's just, it's a world I love visiting mm. every time I rewatch it. It's just, it's it's magnificent. Okay. It's, it's haunting, it's disturbing, it's just icky and uncomfortable, but it's just intoxicating at the same time. Yep. Could not have said it better. So it's your favorite Lynch movie. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. It is mine as well. Wow. Yep. Okay. I only have Blue Velvet, I think, ahead of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, probably I still don't... haven't seen that. I still haven't oh seen that. Oh, my Lord, Jabril. <laughs> wow. It's like, <laughs> if I told you, like, Adam, the love of your life is on the other side of that door, but you've never met her. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how that's, fucking excited would you be? That's pretty close, actually. No, it'd be like, it, mm. it's just standing right there. Mm-hmm. It's just on a streaming service for you to enjoy, Jabril, and you're going to fall in. Your life is going to change. You know what's funny? I own it on DVD, too. <laughs> I'm like, I just haven't watched it. <laughs> Watch Blue Velvet. What is the matter with you? I will. Do I it will. tonight. You're, you, will, you will mark your days as before I watch Blue Velvet and after I watch Blue Velvet. Your life will be bifurcated into I two will. specific segments. I and I will, I, I will say, after watching the David Lynch, the Art Life documentary, I'm, uh, I'm really itching to watch it because it seems like... Uh, Based on how he was describing parts of his childhood, mm-hmm. that movie seems semi autobiographical along with Dave along with Eraserhead. Oh, certainly, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. That's one of those movies where it's like I again, David Lynch's weirdness, it's amazing how so many people like get attached to it. And I wouldn't expect to get attached to it when I'm younger, but like man, I saw Blue Velvet when I was ugh, I don't know. Four. <laughs> no, no, I, I I saw it like when like early on in college, I believe, and again, not mm. I don't I think the only Lynch film I had seen was Eraserhead, and um, and I was just like, just as soon as I see the bugs, I'm like, yeah, I'm in, right? I'm in, yeah. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> this this is fucking awesome. <laughs> Once you see the ear in the uh, the Kyle MacLachlan discovers in the middle of the field, it's just like. <laughs> Just, it's just nonchalantly like, yeah, it's an ear. Okay. Well, Blue Velvet, though, is like a legitimate high school lover story. In a way, yeah. Well, I mean, it is, but like it, it, David Lynch's version of that. Exactly, right. So. And you also got Frank Booth just hanging out, just, uh, <laughs> Pep's Blue Ribbon! <laughs> Hi, Nick, kids. We don't drink that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, but anyway, that's my number one. Eraserhead actually might be my number two. Maybe Mulholland Drive or Elephant Man, I guess, are candidates. Uh, but yeah, the first time I saw this was at the Alamo Draft House, and that was just like a life changing experience. It's just one of those things where it's like, wow, I can't believe I live in a country where we can do this. We can just yeah. go to a local movie theater and watch this thing mm-hmm. projected on thirty five millimeter. Yeah, let me ask you guys: what, what do you take any lesson away from this movie? Do you take any overall? Is there any overall point that you take from it in your own life? 
uh, don't have children. <laughs> That's one. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. There's a lesson. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's that one. There's a lot to be said about like, like isolation. I think mm-hmm. in this movie, and and how you try to comfort yourself when you have no one else with you, and all you've got is this you know horrible mutant monster <laughs> that's just <laughs> making your life like absolutely horrendous in every conceivable way but there's something about his relationship with the lady in the radiator yes that's oddly hopeful and and somewhat satisfying and a lot of people that sort of you find that hopeful a lot of people take that ending and interpret it as him killing himself which yeah is, which is fine uh no but there's a lot to be said about like like sort of the the i don't know he, he, cer- he certainly finds a lot of peace with her in a weird way and I, I just kind of like how he's able to pull that out of complete isolation, you know? She also, yeah. like, murders all of his sperm cells, though. <laughs> like, that, that woman is, like, responsible for his, his celibacy. Do you think she's doing it in, in a way that's, like, monstrous or bad? I'm not convinced. I, I well, think, I don't know. As as monstrous and bad as killing sperm cells can be, I guess. Well, I those don't know. Are, those always sort of represented something like like his his. I mean, his feelings on the kid. I mean, it's literally just. I mean, those sperm cells look exactly like the one that's dropped into the to the planet at the beginning, right? And of course, that sperm cell ruins uh, uh, Henry's life. So for him to have like this dream of this woman being like, "No, I'm going to stop all that shit. You don't have to worry about any of that crap." I don't so know. you find that cathartic. Oh, see, I found that to be like an abortion fantasy, <laughs> like a like a horrific abortion fantasy. Interesting. Of just like death and destruction. I I, I never took that as like a hmm. oh the, the lady in the radiator is solving all of my problems. No, I kind of take it as that. Yeah, she's. Oh, she's that's so, an interesting read on it. Yeah, I yeah. guess I I've always taken it a totally different way, but I guess that's not invalid. Hmm. And that is, I wouldn't I'm, say that your your uh, interpretation is invalid either, though. Yeah, that's what I love about this movie so much, and l- like what he said about it, is that it's just this crazy atmospheric infectious thing that i can't describe it's like house and this are the closest thing you get to like a nightmare experience yeah but, i i think actually this is more so than, than house i think house is more of like a straightforward narrative and this is yeah. just absurdist art through, and through. Yeah, yeah one thing that i want to say as well is i'm really getting into sound design and sound effects <laughs> lately and i just the stories of him and Al, the late alan splett you know crafting the sound design for this movie whether it be the wind or just the sort of tactile ways they made just things splashing into water. They just used a regular bathtub or a fan and they just warped these sounds is just really, really, really cool. Yeah. Innovative. Isn't it all yeah. Lynch, like Lynch and his buddy? Like you yep. said, Alan yeah. split. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And still to this day, he is the credited sound engineer on most of his movies, I think. Yeah. Yes. He yep. just, but that's where it comes from the experimenting. And it's yep. funny, like, like if you've ever done sound mixing and and just going outside and trying to uh, obtain certain sounds like that's mm-hmm. like, there's the variety of things you can come up with is amazing and yeah. i and this is like a like like a like a powerhouse example of the stuff that you can do with, with everything that he i mean there's a tremendous amount of restraint with the amount of sound he uses but everything seems kind of deliberate and it matters to down down to like him using the screams of his daughter as the mm-hmm. sounds of the baby right which is fucking weird it is it's so perverse I in know. many ways yeah well, you know, that's interesting you say that, though, because every year at the Oscars, they do this sound editing, sound mixing split. Mm-hmm. They, they always give out two awards for sound, and no one knows what the difference between the two is. And every year, the choice seems to be the most boring choice possible. Yeah. I think, was it 1917 or Ford versus Ferrari that won? I think, actually, they split they this split, year. Yeah, I was going to say one won the other. Okay. Mm. That is the exact movie that wins that category every year. It's either the war movie or the space movie or the one with the most sound in the case of Ford versus Ferrari. It's just like lots of engines, lots of gear shifts, lots of stuff. So here's an Oscar. And very rarely do you see something like Eraserhead, which is not in your face with the sound design, but so inventive and creative with the sound design. Mm -hmm. And I just wish that one year the Academy got out of its own way and said, you know, we're not just going to give it to the movie with the most guns in it. We're going to give it to something a little more inventive like this one. Like David Lynch should have five sound editing Oscars Mm -hmm. by now. Those tend to be the movies that are the most impressive for me. I mean, it's, I I hate, I hate saying the weird ones. I say that all the time, but it's really true. Like the weird ones come up with some of the most interesting sounds 
which is I, I see I've you know I've, in a lot of sci-fi films like in like the Blade Runner films, but honestly, and you'll like this answer is uh, a Quiet Place is one that they missed sure. out tremendously. Mm. I thought that one used sound pretty brilliantly right. because of the lack of sound right in a lot of ways. But it was sparing, exactly yeah. right. But of course, the Oscars don't award sparing; they no. award the most. It's like when they gave Bohemian Rhapsody Best Film Editing. <laughs> it's one of the worst edited movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but it had a cut every two seconds, so they're like, yeah. That was a hard edit, and you don't get points for difficulty, man. I don't know. I don't know. Are um, you saying the Academy is full of normies, Nico? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And I'm saying just put me in charge of the Oscars, and the world would be a better place. Mm-hmm. Make me the czar, I'm telling you. Make me the czar of stupid shit. Why do you want to be the shit. czar? I want to be the czar that's, of stupid shit. That's weird, man. <laughs> Also, I wanted to say Eraserhead's fucking hilarious. <laughs> hilarious movie. It's also very funny. Mm-hmm. Just Ro- cut them like chickens. Regular chickens. <laughs> okay, Paul. <laughs> that, that, that scene in the Twin Peaks, The Return, where he, he says, this is what we do at the FBI. It is exactly <laughs> the same. As soon as I saw it, I just... <laughs> it is exactly the same. <laughs> It's so good. There's a lot of that stuff. The, yeah. A lot of the imagery in in that original movie is used all throughout his career, mm-hmm. and it, I think it's only gotten better over time and more effective. He's yeah, so fear of the good. atomic bomb, yeah. the stark landscapes, yeah, yeah. The story behind this one is that Lynch was studying at the American Film Institute, and he actually I think had a degree already in visual arts. Like he wanted to become an artist. And someone took a liking to his art, gave him a scholarship at AFI, and he became an absurdist filmmaker at the age of 24. Almost drops out of AFI until they offer him a little bit of cash to make this student film. And I I think, like, the dean of students at AFI offered him the scholarship, and when the board of directors did not want to give him the money, the dean threatened to quit. Mm. Ends up making the movie at AFI. This is, I think, one of the most successful student films ever made. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the rest is history. So... It, the thing about Lynch that's always interesting is he's a really good filmmaker, but it's almost like he stumbled into becoming a really good filmmaker. Oh, yeah. It's like that talent was always there, but he was never really pursuing that. He just wanted to pursue this muse that that was calling him. You know, he always wanted to be an artist, and film was just the medium. I love that though. Isn't that so mm-hmm. interesting? Because it happens every once in a while. It happened to George Miller too. Yeah, where it's like he was just a, a paramedic on in, in an ambulance, and he was driving mm-hmm. around in cars and saw a bunch of mutilated bodies, and he's like. Let's make a movie about this. Right. This would be funny. Yeah. And for no reason at all. He was already a doctor. And yeah, it's a, it's a similar example here where it's like, because I've read about this and it's like, yeah, he should have been a painter. Sure. But he, but he became a filmmaker. And he could have been a painter and he could have yeah. been a really good yeah. painter, but luckily we got him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have you heard the, did you hear that story of uh, how he decided to become a filmmaker? So one day he was painting something and uh, it was a landscape or something. So uh, the wind was coming into his window. And so the idea came to him. Oh, a moving painting. That's how I can do this. Yep. <laughs> he tells that story a lot. So there's... A moving painting. Yes. A moving painting. There we go. I was I was expecting it to not be some senile shit, but Yes. <laughs> Even at twenty two he was fucking senile, David Lynch. <laughs> Oh, and I recommend The Grandmother if you guys have never seen that, his short film uh, prior to this. It's very, very good. Okay, I need to check very that out. Very eerie. Very eerie. What'd you, Sick. What'd you think of What Did Jack Do? I feel like, we, you know... I, didn't I, we I, talk to him about this? Oh, no, I'm sorry. We talked to no, David we Lynch didn't about this. No, we didn't talk about it with him, Nico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what'd you think of it, Jabril? You can burn in hell. <laughs> Good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's something. Stream yeah. Eraserhead on the Criterion channel. Yeah. Yep. You have it. 